jump into Greek drama and I realized over the weekend I really should have arranged the syllabus differently in, in one way. Um, something that we're reading much later after all the drama and after After all the drama and after Plato, um, on the 24th of October, I've got Aristotle's uh, Nicomachean Ethics and the Poetics. And if I'd been smarter when I did the syllabus, um, I would have moved that up. The only reason I didn't do it, I mean, the reason I did the syllabus is set the way it is, is it's chronological. Okay? And Aristotle comes after. Plato, but it would have been nice to have read um, the bit that is from the Poetics in here. Would have been nice to have that prior to reading these plays because Aristotle comments on not quite all of these, but definitely when we get to Sophocles, he comments on Sophocles. He does comment a little bit on um, Aeschylus. It would just help in terms of understanding the plays a little bit better. And before we jump into Aeschylus, Aeschylus, page 11 in your text, you've got a diagram or plan of the theater of Dionysius at Athens. Now, this is a pretty, um, this is a pretty complex theater. Okay. Not all Greek theaters were as, uh, what's the phrase I want, massively built as this. Um, this holds several hundred. Where you see the seating, that's, that's um, stone. And if you go there, I mean, they still produce plays there every season. Um, play season, that is, not during during winter. Um, but what I want to emphasize there is you've got the stage, and towards the back of the stage, you have the thing labeled D, the skinny or skinny, okay? That in later Elizabethan theater, that is what would be called the tiring house. That's where the actors come in and out of generally. It's where they put on um, in later plays, costumes, because remember, in, in drama of this time period, they're not wearing costumes. They're just wearing regular clothes. What they do have on are masks, okay? And the masks help to project the sound. Um, but just looking at that plan briefly, you've got A, what's called the orchestra, okay? This is not our modern notion of an orchestra. This is the area where the chorus generally is involved in the play. B, okay, so you've got, you know, essentially like this. And then the plan has B here, B here. This is the orchestra. This is where the chorus generally stands. When the chorus enters the stage and does something, they're either coming from here or from here. If they come on here, they then generally move across the stage and exit that direction. If it's the other way, they go in the other direction. That's what the strophe and anti-strophe is. Moving one, and then the other is the opposite. Okay? Um, so the orchestra is down in front of the people. Now, in, in many of the plays, one thing I don't like about this text is um, there's a lot of stage direction given. And in other texts I have of either Aeschylus or Sophocles, there's almost no stage direction other than, for example, Sophocles begins with, you know, you've got the palace in the background. That's essentially the skena or the skein, if you want. Okay. Um, and that's about it. But, but these editors have given quite a bit of um, stage directions. In the Sophoclean plays, some of what the chorus does is down here. 
not up on the stage, right? And then, you know, seating all around in the back. So just keep that design in mind as we um, look at Agamemnon, because we're going to try to get all of Agamemnon done, to le done today. So we have, we've got Aeschylus, after him, Sophocles, after him, Euripides, these are the ones we're going to be um, reading, at least. Uh, so we've got the three Aeschylus, two Sophocles. Uh, the book does not include Oedipus and Clonus. And then Euripides is, uh, we're only reading one of, if we get to it, uh, Euripides, Medea. These are the three great tragedians of Greek literature, right? Aeschylus, the father of Greek tragedy. Simply called that because he is the first one to write. Right? Um, wrote a lot of plays. I'm not going to read everything that's in the um, introduction. But notice both Aeschylus and Sophocles aren't only playwrights. They're also statesmen of sorts, politicians of sorts, warriors of sorts. Okay? They both go off and fight in the Peloponnesian Wars. Um, Aeschylus is also involved in the wars against the Persians, you know, 300 those Persians. Um, he doesn't live nearly as long as Sophocles. Look at his dates. Uh, 525 to 456. So, 81? My math is right. Something like that. Sophocles is 90. Okay. Um, they both write their plays primarily for the religious festivals, and they both were award-winning, that is, festival-winning playwrights. Uh, Euripides, I don't remember, I'm just drawing a blank um, on him. But a couple of things out of the introduction. Um, page 612, the final paragraph. The editors write, like the book of Job, Virgil's Aeneid, and Milton's Paradise Lost, the Oresteia, which is the three plays we're going to be reading, the Oresteia explores the perennially urgent question of whether suffering and evil can be reconciled with cosmic justice. And if it can, if it can be reconciled, how? So, what is the relationship between strict justice and human welfare? That is, what is best for humans? Individual and communal. Social order would seem to demand that evil acts be punished. Isn't that what the Furies say repeatedly evil must be punished and it's their job it's their right to do that especially when as in Aeschylus's trilogy these acts violate the most fundamental relationships husband wife parent child etc and then the editor um, says very last uh, couple sentences there in our own time the question independent of theology that is you don't even need to bring theology the relations of um, God and man so to speak uh, the question underlies the debate about the function of punishment, mercy, rehabilitation, and deterrence in the judicial and penal systems. Okay? It's not coincidental that the Oresteia, or Oresteia ends with the establishment of a law court. We're going to talk about that as because we're going to see a movement from the first play through the third in terms of how justice is enacted. The first play, for example, opens, and look, uh, before we begin, on 616 at that genealogy, because the genealogy is really important for helping us understand everything that happens in Agamemnon, Libation Bearers, and the Eumenides. So you start with Tantalus. Tantalus has a son named Pelops. Pelops then has two children, Thyestes and Atreus. Now, we're familiar with Atreus because we keep hearing the um, phrase, or we've heard the phrase in the Odyssey, you know, the son of Atreus, or the Atreidae, the children or sons of Atreus. But Atreus has a brother, Thyestes, okay, who has a son, Aegisthus, who marries Clytemnestra. He had other children. What happened to those other children? I think he had two other sons. 
Atreus kills them and serves them to him. Okay. Atreus has two sons, Menelaus and Agamemnon. Okay. Menelaus marries Helen. Agamemnon marries Clytemnestra. Helen and Clytemnestra are sisters, by the way. Okay. Agamemnon and Clytemnestra have three children. The eldest, Iphigenia, then Electra, then Orestes. Okay. Iphigenia, you can read the play, Iphigenia and Aulis. Iphigenia is the one that Agamemnon sacrifices before the Trojan War even begins. It's while they are trying to leave port. The winds won't allow the Greek ships to leave port. And Agamemnon is told by a prophecy, by a prophet, you have to sacrifice your daughter. He doesn't want to. Read the play. He doesn't want to. It's not like he receives a prophecy and like, oh, okay, and just walks off and, you know, sacrifices her. There's a lot of internal struggle, but he does sacrifice her. It's from that moment on, this is implied in Agamemnon, it's from that moment on that Clytemnestra starts the planning of his own demise. So he's gone for 20 years. Over that 20 years, she's thinking, if he ever comes back, he's a dead man because of this. All right? And that's what you get in the, uh, it's not really a note, but the comment on page 616, just above the dramatis persona. So the play opens on page 617. Dear gods, set me free from all the pain. What pain? Is it the long watch I keep? One whole year awake? Is it the pain from having to be on watch? Hmm? Okay. Is it? Is he saying this is a pain having to be on watch and set me free from this? Or is there another pain that the speaker is referring to, that the watchman is referring to? I think you're going to see it's another pain. It's the pain of human life. It's the human condition. Okay. One of my favorite films of all time, Princess Pride. What does the prince say to the princess? Life is pain, highness. Okay. Set me free from all the pain, the long watch I keep, one whole year awake, propped on my arms. He goes on and he says, line 10, And now I watch for the light, the signal fire, breaking out of Troy, shouting, Troy is taken. Well, who has set up the signal fires? Clytemnestra. How do these fires work? If we had a map, you would have over here, you'd have Troy, and then you have the Bosporus. These signal fires are kind of going across the mainland of Greece. Every, I don't know, five or six miles, something so that they can easily be seen. And the idea is, once Troy falls, a sentry lights the first bonfire. And then like dominoes, once one bonfire is lit, they all come up. Line, uh, she goes, uh, the speaker goes on. Shouting, Troy is taken. So she commands, this is Clytemnestra, full of her high hopes, that woman, she maneuvers like a man. Now, if you read the introduction, what does the introduction say about quote-unquote gender roles within the play? That Clytemnestra turns them upside down. Because Clytemnestra, as the speaker here is saying, maneuvers, acts like a man. She's in charge, not Aegisthus. All right. The speaker seems to be saying, this is a problem. Well, we're going to see how it's a problem when we get to Antigone. Because what's going to bother Crayon in Antigone is not so much that Antigone bears her buries her brother's body. It's that she's a she who doesn't obey his will. I mean, that seems to really... Um, Unman him, let's say. So, the speaker goes on. When I keep to my bed, soaked and dew, and the thoughts go groping through the night, and the good dreams that used to guard my sleep, that is, when I get to leave my watch and finally get to sleep, what happens? It's the old comrade, 
terror at my neck. The old comrade, I think, is tied to and related to the pain. It's not only the pain of the human condition. It's also the pain that they're living under Argos at this time. Okay, the, the reign, so to speak, of Clytemnestra. So, shakes himself awake. 21. I cry for the hard times come to the house, no longer run like the great place of old. Now, you don't have a footnote, but what's the hard times come to the house? The war? What happened as a result of the war? Yeah, Agamemnon's still not there. Okay, what else? Okay. Of Clytemnestra and Aegisthus? It's possible. What other hard times have come to the house? And when did they come? You got to go back to earlier family history, okay? Ever since, not just Atreus, Tantalus, Tantalus killed. It's mentioned in your book, and I just drew a complete blank. Tantalus killed somebody and tried to feed that person to the gods. The gods realized it, so what do they do to Tantalus? They place him in the river. In such a manner that the water comes up and it comes up just about to here, but he can't bend his head down to drink. He's always perched. And they placed him in such a way that there are grapes hanging just out of reach. Okay? So that's why we have the word tantalizing. Something that is tantalizing, what? Makes your mouth water, makes you want it, and yet you can never get it. Okay? I think that's part of what he's, what the speaker is saying here. These old problems that have come to the house, this family is damned, essentially, okay, because of the actions of its um, ancestors. Go on to the next page. And I'm just going to do, I'm going to skip bunches and focus on bunches, etc. 618, he sees the signal fire. Okay, about line 28 or so. And then 31, praise the gods for the beacon. There it burns, fire all the way, starts to dance, and the watchman says, just bring him home. My king, I will take your loving hand in mine, and then dot, dot, dot. The rest is silence. Anybody know, anybody know of another character in another play, who, in another era, who says the rest is silence? Those are Hamlet's very last words. Okay? I'll take your loving hand in mine, and then... Dot, dot, dot. The rest is silence. Why? I'm not going to talk about what's going to happen. That's what is implied. The rest is silence is the watchman saying, uh, you're not going to pry this out of me. That's one meaning of it. The other meaning of it is, that's all there will be from Agamemnon when he returns. <laughs> because he's not going to live that long. The ox is on my tongue. you got a footnote down there. My lips are sealed. Okay. The watchman, your footnote tells you, probably thinking of the affair. But the house and these old stones, give them a voice, and what a tale they tell. Now, yeah, surface level, let's say, of the old stones, what would they tell? They talk about the affair. But you get deeper, and what has, you know, seeped into the stone metaphorically over the years? The blood of the house of Tantalus. I think the watchman is getting essentially at this idea that you know, every generation of this house has its own peculiar, what do you want to call these? Foibles? <laughs> Problems? So the chorus comes in. And the chorus says, Ten years gone, ten to the day, our great avenger went for Priam. Our great avenger, Agamemnon, Menelaus and Lord Agamemnon, two kings with the power of Zeus. 
See, beginning with Aeschylus, you equate a human with one of the gods. You either say so-and-so is prettier than the gods, or so-and-so is as powerful as the gods, or so-and-so is as wise as the gods, and almost inevitably, what can you count on happening? Yeah, the person being compared is brought down. Okay? That's, you know, Helen. Helen launched, essentially, the Trojan War. Why? Because Paris said she's as pretty as Athena, Aphrodite, and... Is it Artemis? Can't remember the third one. Okay? Um, top of the next page, line 60 or so. So the chorus keeps talking, and the purpose of the chorus, and this is more so in Sophocles and Euripides and following playwrights, not as much in Aeschylus, but it is some. The purpose of the chorus is to comment on either what's previously been said or what's previously been done, the action. In Aeschylus, the chorus is more of a, an actual central actor, especially we're going to see that in this and in the next play, because in the next play, I mean, the chorus is really egging on um, both the Furies and others. Okay. So the chorus says, and this is them all together, so they're all saying this as a group, however large the, uh, the chorus is. Someone hears on high, Apollo, Pan, or Zeus. You got a footnote? They're respectively what? The god of prophecy, Apollo, nature, Pan, and everything, king of the gods, Zeus. Yet someone hears on high, Apollo, Pan, or Zeus, the piercing wail, these guests of heaven raised, and drives at the outlaws, late but true to revenge, a stabbing fury. And the chorus introduces the notion of the Furies at this point. Okay. Zeus, the god of guests, drives Atreus' sons at Paris, all for a woman manned by many. Look at the note. Helen had been courted by innumerable suitors in addition to the man she married. But notice the verbiage of that line. All for a woman manned by many. That is, taken possession of. I mean, to speak, the chorus there is suggesting Helen didn't only have as her lovers Menelaus and Paris, many other lovers. It's because of her. And now it goes as it goes, and where it ends is fate. Neither by singeing flesh, nor tipping cups of wine, nor shedding burning tears, can you enchant away the rigid fury. In other words, the, the Furies cannot be what? That the gods can. Merciful. Louder? Merciful. Merciful? Close. Reason yeah. You can't reason with the Furies. You can't placate the Furies. You can't merely offer the Furies a sacrifice. Why not? Not how justice works. Because you just don't want to be punished. You're not actually a fury. Okay. What are the furies used to getting in terms of their notion of justice? Okay. How much? The wrongdoer, let's say. If the wrongdoer sacrifices to them, what do, according to this idea of placation, what do they not get? The wrongdoer. See, the Furies are used to getting it all. If we were to jump to Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice and Shylock demanding his pound of flesh from Antonio for wronging him, if the if Antonio excuse me, if Shylock were a Fury, he wouldn't take just a pound of flesh. He gets it all. He gets everything. Right? So the Furies are tied up with what kind of notion? It's this idea of justice. Eye for an eye. Okay? So, Clytemestra comes in. She's on the stage. And notice 
While she's lighting altar fires, the chorus says, we're the old dishonored ones, broken husks of men. Even then they cast us off the rescue mission, etc. Et In other words, we were the ones that were too old, too frail, too infirm to go fight for battle. But you, 993 or so, you, daughter of Leda, Queen Clytemnestra, what now, what news, what message drives you through the citadel, burning victims? Argo, skipping a few lines, Argos blazes. Tell us the news, what you can, what is right. She ignores them. She goes about her rituals. I sing, top of 621, line 115. I sing how the flight of fury hurled the twin command, one will that hurled young Greece and winged the spear of vengeance straight for Troy. Okay, what's the fury here? It's not one of the furies. This is the human emotion of fury, of anger. Okay, what's the fury at Paris taking Helen? The kings of birds to kings of the breaking prows, one black, one with a blaze of silver, and swooping lower all could see, plunged their claws in a hair, a mother bursting with unborn young, the babies spilling, quick spurts of blood, cut off the race, just dashing into life, cry, cry for death. But good went out in glory in the end. Okay? This little passage is referring not just to the Greeks going over against Argos, but what else? What had to happen so they could? The eagle getting the hair? It's Agamemnon slaughtering his daughter. 140, skipping a bit. Artemis, lovely Artemis. What is Artemis the goddess of? The hunt. So kind to the ravening lion's tender helpless cubs, the suckling young of beasts that stalk the winds. Bring this sign for all its fortune, all its brutal torment home to birth. I beg you, healing Apollo, soothe her. Okay? That is, soothe Artemis. Why is Artemis brought in? Who's on the hunt? Well, now it's Clytemnestra for her husband. Healing Apollo, soothe her. Before her crosswinds hold us down and moor the ships too long, pressing us on to another victim. Nothing sacred, no feast to be eaten. That's going back to both Tantalus and his offering of his son to the gods and Atreus and his offering of Thyestes' children uh, to be eaten the architect of vengeance, growing strong in the house with no fear of the husband. Here she waits, getting ready to spring the trap. The terror raging back and back in the future. Back and back in the future. The terror raging back and back, that is, Ancestors, but also what? In the future. This terror of this family line. The Aeschylus seems to be saying, not only harkens way back in the past, it's going to keep going into the future unless something breaks the cycle. Well, that's what the three plays are about. Breaking the cycle, stopping the cycle. So, Lift this weight, 167, the chorus cries. Lift this weight, this torment from my spirit, praying to Zeus, cast it once for all. Zeus has led us on to know, skipping the next stanza, the helmsman lays it down as law that we must suffer, suffer into truth. This is the lot of humanity. It's suffering that teaches truth. We cannot sleep and drop by drop at the heart the pain of pain remembered comes again. And we resist, but ripeness comes as well. Ripeness. What's the speaker mean by ripeness? What does the course mean by ripeness? I think it's understanding. Illumination, if you want. Wisdom of some sort. From the gods enthroned on the awesome rowing bench, there comes a violent love. Okay? Then the cure for the storm, top of the next page. And it was harsher. Calchas, the old prophet, cried, 
My captain's Artemis must have blood. This is the blood that is needed before they can depart all us. As harsh as the sons of Atreus dashed their scepters on the rocks, could not hold back the tears. And we hear, obey, obey, or a heavy doom will crush me. And what happens? 2.10, a father's hands are stained. Agamemnon kills his daughter. Blood of a young girl streaks the altar. Pain both ways. And what is worse? Desert the fleets, fail the alliance. That is, if we don't do this, the fleets will sink. We won't get Helen back. What's the poet essentially, or the playwright essentially saying? What kind of decision did Agamemnon need to make? Do I defend Menelaus' honor and sacrifice my daughter? Or do I say, sorry Menelaus, and let my daughter live? No, but stop the winds with a virgin's blood. Feed their lust, their fury. The there is the winds. Feed their fury. Law is law. And once he slipped his neck in the strap of fate, his spirit veering black and pure, unholy, once he turned, he stopped at nothing, seized with the frenzy, blinding, driving to outrage, wretched frenzy, cause of all our grief. Yes, he had the heart to sacrifice his daughter, to bless the war that avenged a woman's loss, a bridal rate, rate that sped the men of war. Okay, I think those lines are saying, once he decided to do it, how did Agamemnon sacrifice his daughter? Full bore. He didn't hold anything back. My father, my father, you get the implication, Iphigenia screams. No innocent moves her judges mad for war. Her father called his henchmen on, on with a prayer, hoist her over the altar, Yaka Yili, and give it all your strength. She faints. They gag her to keep her from screaming, and she's sacrificed. 249, the strong techniques of Calchas do their work. The gods are appeased, but justice, justice turns the balance scales, sees that we suffer and we suffer and we learn. Why? Why do we have to learn from suffering? What kind of hope did the Greeks have, you know, for quote-unquote, meaning to life. They didn't learn from it, it was just pain. Well, yeah, I mean, that's true. They didn't have any hope, really, for meaning in life. You die and that's it. You go off what? You go off to Hades to be with the dead, or if you're really lucky, I mean, if you are choice, select by the gods, you got to go where? Yeah, the Elysian Fields. How many do? Very, very few. I mean, Achilles doesn't even get to go there. Oedipus does. If we were reading, I wish the book had the third Oedipus play. If we were reading Oedipus at Colonus, in Oedipus at Colonus, the gods come down and they say at the end of the play, Oedipus, because you have suffered so much, we are raising you up. And it's not just that he goes to the Elysian Fields. Oedipus is, I can remember how to spell the word, spelled something like that, apotheosized. He is made into a god. He's raised as a god. Why? Because of his suffering. Kind of implies that God suffer. That they are gods because of their suffering. The gods don't suffer. Okay. So, the leader turns to Clytemnestra and says, um, here we are. We respect your power. Right it is to honor the warlord's woman once he leaves the throne. But, but why the fires... Let the new day shine, as the proverb says, glorious from the womb of Mother Night. Okay? Notice the footnote. 
Ironically, the Avenging Furies are also offspring of Primeval Night, and they're going to talk an awful lot about night when they speak in the next play. You will hear a sound, uh, Joy Beyond Your Hopes, Priam Citadel, the Greeks have taken Troy. Does she really care all that much that the Greeks have defeated Troy? No, her real concern is that Agamemnon is coming home. The leader, 273 or so. You have proof? I do, I must, unless the god is lying. That or a phantom spirit sends you into raptures. No one takes me in with visions, senseless dreams. Why does she say that? Okay, what is she saying about the gods? How do the gods often speak to humans in dreams? Okay, she calls them senseless. What is she suggesting there? The gods. I think that's one of her, one of the indications of what she's suggesting. Leader. Or giddy rumor, you haven't indulged yourself. You treat me like a child. You mock me? Then when did they storm the city last night? And who on earth could run the news so fast? The god of fire. And she says how the fires progressed. From Ida, from Troy, to Lemnos, Hermes Spur, Great Light West, to the Saving Father's Face. These are mountaintops that she's referring to. Mount Athos, third in the chain. Leaping oceans back to Mount Machistos. In other words, I've heard how the fire came. She knows where the beacon fires are. She mentions three, uh, line 299, Kitheron's crest. Kitheron is the mount that's going to be referred to a couple of times in Oedipus. Pretty significant for Oedipus. Line 310, and now, that is the last flame. And now the true son of the burning flanks of Ida crashes on the roofs of Atreus's sons. Notice, the flame crashes. Kind of implies it's going to bring down the roof of Atreus's sons. And I ordained it all. That is, and I put it all into place. Okay, so they talk a little bit more. And 339 or so, Clytemnestra says, lucky men off guard at last, they sleep away their first good night in years. That is, once the flame came, people could kind of relax. If only they are revering the city's gods, the shrines of the gods who love the conquered land, no plunderer will be plundered in return. Okay? That is, plunderers won't be plundered if they do what? They revere the gods of the city they plunder. If they don't honor, sacrifice to those gods, what's going to happen? Those gods are going to bring a reversal, a turn of change of fortune on them. Just let no lust, no mad desire seize the armies to ravish what they must not touch, overwhelmed by all they've won. Don't let the warriors rape, essentially, the women of the city. Because if they do... They're not revering the city's gods. Well, Agamemnon's going to say something about rape and the city when he does get a few lines to speak. And even if the men come back with no offense, she's, she goes on, with no offense to the gods, the avenging dead may never rest. Oh, let no new disaster strike. It's kind of like there's enough old disasters. Leader, spoken lump. Like a man, my lady, loyal, full of self-command, self-command, self-control, self-awareness. Okay. So, the chorus goes on, addresses Zeus and night. Talks about how much the chorus adores Zeus. And in 372, talking about Troy, or 371, it is all Troy's to tell, but even I can trace it to its cause. The fall of Troy, 
God does as God decrees. And still, some say that heaven would never stoop to punish men who trample the lovely grace of things untouchable. How wrong they are. In other words, the gods will stoop. A curse burns bright on crime. Full-blown, the father's crimes will blossom. Burst into the sons. That is, the father's crimes will be what? How does the Old Testament put it? It will be revisited onto the children. Let there be less suffering. Give us the sense to live on what we need. The chorus is saying there, what is the cause? What is a cause? Not necessarily the cause of human suffering. If any of you are Buddhist, what does Buddha say is the cause of suffering? Unbalance. Okay? Unbalance caused by what? Choice. Really close. Desire. The desire for excess. Unbalance is because you want something that you obviously don't have. Okay? Look what he said. Let there be less suffering. Give us the sense to what? Live on what we need. That's live on only what we need and not any more. Okay? It's one of the lessons, by the way, King Lear has to learn throughout that play. Bastions of wealth are no defense for the man who treads the giant altar of justice down and out of sight. Down and out of sight means when he's dead. All the wealth in the world does you no good. But the gods, skipping several lines, 398 or so, but the gods are deaf to the one who turns to crime. They tear him down. You can be wealthy, you can be famous, but if you turn to crime, whatever, however you define that crime, the gods won't listen. So Paris learned. What, what was the judgment of Paris? Who is the most beautiful of the gods? He came to Atreus's house, shamed the table spread for guests. He stole away the queen. That is, he took Helen. She left her land chaos. That is, in chaos. Um, skip over to 425. So he grieves at the royal hearth, yet others' grief is worse, far worse. And all through grief, all through Greece, for those who flock to war, they are holding back the anguish now. You can feel it rising now in every house. I tell you, there is much to tear the heart. Why? The war's been won. What are people hoping for? People back in Greece from those who have been off fighting the war. Husbands, fathers, brothers, uncles will return. And yet, from reading the Odyssey, and if we, uh, from reading the Odyssey, what do we learn? An awful lot of them don't return. Not just Ulysses men. A lot of Agamemnon's men don't return. They knew the men they sent, but now in place of men, ashes in urn. War, war, the great gold broker of corpses, holds the balance of the battle on his spear. Home from the pyres he sends them, home from Troy to the loved ones, weighted with tears, the urns brimmed full. Skipping several lines. He went down so tall in the onslaught, all for another's woman. The hundreds, the thousands, who died all for Helen. So they mutter in secret, and the rancor steals toward our staunch defender, Atreus' sons. The chorus is saying, women are now in their homes saying, my husband died because of her. And it's also because of Atreus' sons, Agamemnon and Menelaus. They're the ones who went to war just for her. The course is essentially saying what about Helen? She wasn't worth it. 
it was, the war wasn't worth it. The cost was too great. Top of 630. And now I wait. I listen. There, there's something breathing under the night's shroud. The shroud. The burial garment. Okay? God takes aim at the ones who murder many. God there refers to Zeus. All right? The swarthy fury stalked the man, gone rich beyond all rights. With a twist of fortune, grind him down, dissolve him into the blurring dead. There is no help. That is, for the man who has that twist of fortune, the change of fortune, nothing can help that person. Doesn't matter what your wealth is, okay? Fortune there might be able to be defined as fate, though in the Greek thought, Greek system, fate is separate, okay? It's from the Greek notion of, uh, of fortune that you get the later medieval idea of, you know, fortune's wheel, which is always turning. Where is it best to be on fortune's wheel? Preferably not on the top. Well, but everybody is. Is it best to be on top? Best to be on this side. Why? Because you're always right. Once you reach the top of Fortune's Wheel, and this applies, we're going to see, to these plays, what happens? That's reversal. Oedipus rises to the top, and what happens? Boom! He falls. How far does he fall? From the greatest height there is. Okay? Agamemnon. What can Agamemnon theoretically, be doing at this point. He's won the Battle of Troy. He's won the Trojan War. Ticker tape parade down Wall Street, you know. Great hero. And yet, what happens? He comes home, reversal of fortune. Why? Because the event that he started, or that he used to begin the great battle, the swarthy fury stalk the man, notice, gone rich beyond all rights. With a twist of fortune, grind him down. Dissolve him into the blurring dead. There is no help. Once you're dead, it's it. There's, there's no coming back. There's no relief, etc. So, um... Chorus keeps talking, and the leader then speaks. Now nah, we'll skip that. Look at uh, 631, the herald speaks. So the herald comes in, kneels on the ground, and says 5, 12, or 13. I think it's 5, 13. He comes, he brings us light in the darkness. Now, notice what your translator is doing there. The, the translator wants to bring in a biblical echo. A light that was shining in darkness to the opening of John's Gospel. He comes, he brings this light in the darkness, free for every comrade, Agamemnon, Lord of men. Give him the royal welcome he deserves. He hoisted the pickaxe of Zeus, who brings revenge. He dug Troy down. Notice, he acted as Zeus's revenge on Troy. He worked her soil down, the shrines of her gods, the high altars gone, the seed of her white earth, he ground to bits. The herald saying he destroyed Troy. Okay? So, the herald and the leader talk back and forth a bit. And the leader is implying something's been going on during the time that Agamemnon's been gone. Which, for Agamemnon and the other warriors, it's 10 years. For Odysseus, it's 20 years. What? With the kings gone, did someone threaten you? That is, in Agamemnon's absence, somebody threaten you? Uh, as you say, it would be good to die. Why does the leader say that? What's the leader mean?
Does the leader know what Clytemnestra is planning? I kind of think it's implied. Harold, true, we have done well. Think back in the years and what have you. A few runs of bad luck. A lot that's bad. A few runs of bad luck. You know, that little thing with, with Tantalus and, and Pelops and, and Atreus and Thiasis. Yes. Who but a god can go through life unmarked? You know, I think that kind of line, and you get several little lines like that, that kind of line is designed to kind of be zingers to the audience. Who can go through life unmarked? The unmarked means unnoticed. By whom? The gods. In other words, very, very few people get to go through life just kind of sailing without any problems at all. A long, hard pull we had, if I would tell it all. In other words, the last 10 years, pretty hard. 562, the dead can rest and never rise again. No need to call their muster. We're alive. Do we have to go on raking up old wounds? Why do you want to know? For us, the remains of the Greek contingents, that is, we are the remains of the Greek contingents, the good wins out. No pains can tip the scales. Not now. We've won. What's their old saying? We get to come back to Greece and live what? Our lives to old age. The Herald's making a huge assumption here by saying, we fought for 10 years, we survived, now we come home. It's like, you know, you hear stories not as much recently as back during the, when the Iraq war was hot and everything. Somebody be over there, they fight for three tours of duty, they come home and they get shot, you know, drive-by shooting in Detroit or something. Zeus will have the, sheer, the hero's share of fame. He did the work at the end of that speech. Okay. The Herald is saying, don't worry, we'll give Zeus the credit. That's all I have to say. Leader, I'm convinced. <laughs> you got me believing... I'm convinced, glad that I was wrong. Never too old to learn, keeps me young. Now, the leader has implied several times what about his age? As opposed to the heralds. The herald is younger. What's the leader essentially saying? I've been around longer than you have, boy. Okay. I'll... The leader knows what the leader is talking about. Okay, so Clytemnestra then comes back in and speaks. And I'm going to pick up with after she turns to the herald on 634. She says, but enough. Why prolong the story? From the king himself I'll gather all I need. Now for the best way to welcome home my lord, my good lord. I can see the light, the husband plucked from war by the saving God and opened wide the gates. Okay, the light, she's talking about Agamemnon. She's describing him as the light. Tell him that, have him come with speed. The people's darling, how they long for him and for his wife. May he return and find her true at hall, just as the day he left her, faithful to the last. A watchdog gentle to him alone. And then she looks at the palace, savage to those who cross his path. I have not changed. The strains of time can never break our seal. In love with a new lord, in ill repute I am, as practiced as I am in dying bronze. Okay? Now, I read those lines. What do those lines sound like she is saying? Okay, she's addressing the herald. Tell your lord to come. Come quickly. I can't wait to see him. Tell him what else about me. I've been faithful to him. I'm as faithful to him now as I was the day he left. What does that tell us about Clytemnestra and the day she left? The day Agamemnon left. Hence the implication. That even when he left, she was already unfaithful to him. Okay. And that she's been savage to those who cross him, those who try to 
harm his kingdom. That's my boast, teeming with the truth. So, what literary device or technique is being used in these lines? Yeah, this is dramatic irony. Again, these stories, okay, Aeschylus is writing this in sometime. I don't think there's an actual date for this one, or there might be. Probably in the mid 490s, okay? Aeschylus is dealing with material that's really old. He doesn't create this out of his own head. He pulls these stories out of, uh, pulls these um, names and situations out of stories that have been told for hundreds of years, just like Homer did with the Iliad and Odyssey. Okay? We think, pretty sure, the Trojan War really occurred, and it occurred sometime around 1200 to 1175 B.C. Well, Homer's living 400 years later. So these stories have gotten passed down orally about what happened, and he then puts them down in writing. Similarly with Aeschylus and then Sophocles and Euripides, there are these stories floating around in the ether, and each one of them takes them and casts them in the particular shape that we see them. So when she says, I have not changed, the strains of time can never break our seal, in love with a new lord, in ill repute I am, as practiced as I am in dying bronze. Well, how easy is it to dye bronze? You can't really. The dye just runs off. Okay? So she's saying, I am not in love with a new lord, and I am not in ill repute. But things have already kind of been implied that, well, maybe you are a little bit. So the leader asks, Menelaus, is he home too? Safe with the men? The power of the land, dear king? Harold, I doubt that lies well up, my friends, in the lean mo months to come. Okay, speak, tell forth. But when the two conflict, it's hard to hide. Out with it. Shoot, didn't mean to take that out. Um, he's lost. Gone from the fleets. He and his ship, it's true. What, you, you watched after he pulled away from Troy? Or did some storm attack you? There, like a marksman, the whole disaster cut to a word. How do the, es er how do the escorts excuse me, give him out, dead or alive? Nobody knows. But then the storm, how did it reach the ships? How did it end? Were the gods angry? Were the angry gods on hand? This blessed day, ruin it with them? What's the herald mean? This is a great day. Our king is finally returning. Why, why do you want to ruin it with talk of the gods? The herald's kind of saying, can't, can't we just forget about the gods for a while? Better to keep their trophies far apart. 646. How can I mix, 645, how can I mix the good with so much bad and blurt out this? Storms swept the Greeks and not without the anger of the gods. Not without, make that positive. <laughs> Storms swept the Greeks and with the anger of the gods. Okay. Talks about the gales coming from the north, the ships ramming. When the sun comes up the next day, the Aegean heaving into a great bloom of corpses. Dead, just floating. 661. Not us, not our ship, our hull untouched. Someone stole us away or begged us off. No mortal, a god, death grip on the tiller, or Lady Luck herself perched on the helm. She pulled us through. She saved us. I will never battle. The heavy surf and anchor never shipwreck up some rocky coast. Skipping a couple stanzas in Menelaus. Look to it, he's come back, and yet if a shaft of the sun can track him down, alive, his eyes full of the old fire, thanks to the strategies of Zeus, 
Zeus would never tear the house out by the roots. Then there's hope our man will make it home. In other words, we don't quite know where Menelaus is, but Zeus will make sure he gets home. The chorus. What power named the name that drove your fate? And you got a long footnote talking about Helen's name and how the chorus is punning on the root meaning of Helen's name in Greek, destruction, rendered in our translation as hell. Oh, for all the world, top of 637, a Helen. Hell at the prows, front of the ship. Hell at the gates, hell on the men of war. From her lair's shears, veil, she drifted, launched by the giant western wind. All for Helen. Um, do I want to do that one? I've got a whole bunch of this highlighted, but I'm, I think we can skip that. Um, top of 638. The first sensation Helen brought to Troy. Uh, call it a spirit, shimmer of winds dying, glory light as gold shaft of the eyes dissolving, open bloom that wounds the heart with love. Da 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 da. She wheeled her wedding onto a stabbing end, slashed at the sons of Priam, hearth mate, friend to the death, that is uh, Paris, sped by Zeus who, feed, who speeds the guest, a bride of tears, a fury. Only, skipping several lines, on, 751 or so, only the reckless act can breed impiety. What is impiety? Lack of devotion to the gods. Okay. Multiply crime on crime while the house kept straight and just as blessed with radiant children. But violence, ancient violence, longs to breed. New violence comes when its fatal hour comes. The demon comes to take her toll. No war, no force, no prayer can hinder the midnight fury stamped. Okay? Why is the chorus talking about the furies there? Okay, what are the furies supposed to judge? Enter Nessing crimes. What's that mean? Inter-family. And that's one of their chief, so to speak, duties. Crimes within a family. Brother against sister, sister against brother, brother against parent, sister against parent, parent against child. Okay? Well, how did the Trojan War begin? Or the journey to the Trojan War? With a crime of a father against a child. Agamemnon slaughtering his daughter. So, the chorus keeps bringing up the idea of the Furies. Why? Because Iphigenia's blood, metaphorically, is crying out for justice. And possibly Iphigenia in Hades is crying out for justice. Well, who does Iphigenia cry to? Apollo? Athena? The Furies. And the Furies, as I said, cannot be placated. They hound you until they get you and drag you off to the death. But usually, you know, once they get you, you're tortured. Not torture, you know, in the sense of, you know, bamboo shoots up the fingers. Some of the torture is merely conscience. Right? So... 769 or so. Agamemnon comes in in his chariot. His plunder borne before him by his entourage. Behind him, half hidden, stands Cassandra. And the old men, that is the chorus, press all around him. The true son of Atreus. How to salute you, how to praise you, neither too high nor too low. Why? We praise you too high, we compare you to Zeus. Thunderbolt. 
But hit the note of praise that suits the hour. How do we praise you as you deserve or ought to be praised? Okay. The day you marshaled the army is all for Helen, 782 or so. Can't hide it now. I drew you in my mind in black. You seem to menace at the helm, sending men to the grave to bring her home, that hell on earth. Notice, Helen, earth. Search, my king, learn at last who stayed at home and kept their faith, and who betrayed the city. That is, find out who was honest and loyal to you, and who wasn't. What does Ag Agamemnon say? First, with justice, I salute my Argos and my gods, my accomplices, the just gods. He goes on and on. All he does, he thanks the gods. Uh, 807, for that we must thank the gods with the sacrifice. Our sons will long remember. Okay? For their mad outrage of a queen, we raped their city. We were raped. Now, the chorus in Clytemnestra have already implied, raping a city isn't right. <laughs> The beast of Argos falls of the wild mare, blah, 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 blah. Our thanks to the gods. And now, skipping a couple stanzas, he goes down at the bottom. Now we must summon the city for a trial, found a national tribunal. Whatever is healthy, shored up with law, help it flourish. Wherever something calls for drastic cures, we'll do our best. Amputate, wheel, the healing iron, burn the cancer at the roots. But I want to go home. Now I must go to my father's house. I give the gods my right hand, my first salute, the ones who sent me forth and brought me home. What is Agamemnon trying to do? Everything by the book. He's trying to behave honorably. He's trying to do everything as he ought to do as king, showing proper deference to the gods. He gives the gods all the credit for the victory. Okay, Clytemnestra comes in. And says, first, when a woman sits at home and the man is gone, the loneliness is terrible, unconscionable. And the rumors spread and fester. What rumors? Well, maybe she's not so alone. <laughs> a runner comes with something dreadful close on its heels. The next, and a sinew's turn. Or his, I lost my place. And his news worse. So she turns to Agamemnon and she says, 865. And so our child is gone, not standing by our side. The bond of our dearest pledge is mine and yours. By all rights, our child should be here. Dot, dot, dot. Before you see the next word, what are we meant to assume? Because the dot, dot, dot probably indicates in the performance of it, she pauses. And she doesn't just immediately go to arrest him. So that we've heard twice. In the span of four lines, our child should be here. Who are we meant to assume that's supposed to be? Iphigenia. Orestes. You seem startled. You needn't be. You seem startled. What does that tell us about Agamemnon's response to her, our child should be here? He's probably gone from a happy conquering look on his face to a somewhat frowned, frowning stern look like, don't bring that up again. Our loyal brother in arms will take good care of him. In other words, I sent him off to be fostered, to be raised as a future king ought to. Okay. So she says, top of the next page, come to me, my dearest, down from the car, but never set the foot that stamped out Troy on earth again. And this is what I've talked about previously. What does she do? Rolls out the red carpet. By saying that foot that conquered Troy should never set on earth again, what is she saying about him? Louder? He's a god. You're a god. That's what she is saying. The red carpet is reserved for the gods. So Agamemnon says, um, well, notice, let the red stream flow and bear him home to the home he never hoped to see. Notice the irony of that. Because the red stream there, that's his blood. The home he never hoped to see, that's death. Justice lead him 
ends. She is saying, I am an agent of justice. All right? We will set things right with the God's help. We will do whatever fate requires. Agamemnon. Well, there's, there's Leda's daughter. That is, there's my wife. Keeper of my house. Speech uh, to suit my absence much too long. <laughs> that is, his absence was much too long. Not the speech is much too long. This, uh, you, you treat me like a woman. Grow up and get, get up. What am I, some barbarian? Give me the tributes of a man and not a god. A little earth to walk on, not this gorgeous work. What is Agamemnon afraid of? Please, stop. Stop, don't get angry at me. I'm not a god. Let me just walk on the dirt. There is no need to sound my reputation. I have a sense of right and wrong. What's more, heaven's proudest gift. Call no man blessed until he ends his life in peace fulfilled. And I jumped forward in our translation of Oedipus. And I don't like our translation of Oedipus. Because Oedipus has a line towards the very end where it's either Oedipus or the chorus. I think it's the or chorus. It says in most translations, Call no man blessed until he is dead. Some translations read, Count no man happy until he is dead. Ours does something completely different. Okay, so what does he say here? Count no man blessed until he ends his life in peace. In other words, you start counting your blessings in life, and what's going to happen? They're going to get yanked. She says, one, one, one more thing, true to your ideals, tell me. He says, once I violate those, I'm lost. Would you have sworn this act to God in a time of terror? She's talking about walking on the red carpet. If a prophet called for a last drastic rite, but can you see Priam if, Priam if he had your success? Striding on the tapestries of God, I see him now. And you fear the reproach of common men? The voice of the people? Aye. Where's the glory without a little gall? Notice your footnote. Clytemnestra implies great men must be prepared to endure the gall of inferior men's envy. And where's the woman in all this lust for glory? In other words, why are you talking about glory, especially his glory? But the great victor, it becomes him to give way. Victory in this war of ours, it means so much to you? Oh, give way. The power is yours if you surrender all of your own free will to me. Enough. Why is she so concerned with his glory and his victory? I think it goes back to how it began. Your glory and your victory begin with the slaughter of our daughter. Okay. She says, "Come on." Uh, he says, "Come on, hurry!" And while I tread his splendors, dyed red in the sea, may no god watch and strike me down with envy, envy from on high. He knows what he's doing is wrong. I feel such shame to tread the life of the house, a kingdom's worth of silver in the weaving. He goes in. He steps down from the chariot. He reveals Cassandra. Done is done. In other words, he steps on the curtain. That in and of itself, one could interpret as cause for his death. Okay? So he says, And now since you brought me down with your insistence just this once, I enter my father's house. Trampling royal crimson as I go. There is the sea, she says, and who will drain it dry? What's she pointing to? I think the red that he is on. The sea, his blood. So she says a bunch of words. They... Agamemnon goes over the threshold into the palace, and Clytemnestra prays. Zeus, Zeus, master of all fulfillment, now fulfill our prayers. Speed our rites. Should she be praying to Zeus to fulfill her rites? No. Chorus, why does it rock me, never stops, with terror beating down my heart, this seer that sees it all. 
The chorus is telling this because the chorus is here commenting. Something really bad is about to happen. The chorus doesn't know exactly what. Uh, 647, 10, 17 or so. But a man's lifeblood is dark and mortal. Once it wets the earth, what song can sing it back? Once a person is dead, what can bring him back from the dead? Not even the master healer. Okay? Asclepius, who brought the dead to life. Zeus stopped the man before he did more harm. Oh, if only the gods had never forged the chain that curbs our excess. What's the chain that curbs our excess? Death? One man's fate curbing the next man's fate. It's the chain is the chain that links all people together. One man's fate stopping another, that is being the demise of another. One, uh, my heart would outrace my song. And so Clytemnestra comes out of the palace and she talks to Cassandra, daughter of Priam. Says, won't you come in? Come on, come on in. The leader's like, come on, Cassandra, come in, step down, go on in. And we hear 649. Leave the empty chariot of your own free will. Try on the yoke of fate. Aye, Mother Earth. Or Earth, Mother, curse of the earth, Apollo, Apollo. So she calls Apollo her destroyer. And... She and the leader go back quite a bit forth. And what does she tell the leader? Oh, for a song, uh, bottom of 651. For a song of fate like hers, the gods gave her a life of ease, swathed her in wings, no tears, no wailing, the knife waits for me. She's talking about the song of the nightingale, Philomel. They'll play, splay me on the irons double E. What god hurls you on that? It's, what are you talking about? Why the horror clashing through your music? The grief, the grief of the city ripped to oblivion. She's talking about Troy there, 652. The victims, the flocks my father burned at the wall, rich herds. And then she looks at the palace and says, Flushed on the blood of men, their spirit grows, and none can turn away their revel breeding in the veins. The Furies. What's she doing? She's prophesying. She sees what's going to happen. Okay? And the leader's still unsure of what she's talking about. She talks about how Apollo gave her the gift. And the bottom of 653, she says, Once I betrayed him, I could never be believed. She, we believe you, the leader says. The pain, the terror, the birth pain. And she talks about Thyestes' feast on 654. Leader. Yeah, I, I, I know about the story. It's true, real. No dark signs about it. I hear the rest, but it throws me off the scent. Agamemnon, you will see him dead. She makes clear. No use. The healer has no hand in this affair. In other words, Apollo can't stop this. You pray, they close in to kill. What man prepares this? Man? <laughs> I don't see who can bring the evil off, and yet I know my Greek too well. She talks about the lioness. Right? Rips off her Regalia says we're going to die, and she goes in. I'm going to skip a bunch. 658, Cassandra says she must go in, and she does go in, and the chorus, after Cassandra goes in, I'm not going to quite finish this, though, says, but the lust for power never dies. Men cannot have enough. Does the speaker mean men Gendered men? No. He means humanity. The lust for power. What is the speaker or the chorus assuming? Why does Clytemnestra do this? 
because she's ruled for 10 years and she's not about to give up the, the power. Okay? Agamemnon. Ah! Struck deep. What? What's that? The leader hears something. Second blow. The work is done. You can feel it. The king and the great cries. The chorus speaks, and you've got several lines. These are kind of individuals win the chorus, and they're saying this somewhat almost staccato, so that one, and almost before he even finishes, the next one speaks. So, and I say rush in now, catch them red-handed, butchery running on their blades, right with you, do something, now or never. Look at them beating the drum, for instance. It's almost like the chorus is standing here, possibly even in a circle, and they're just right around the circle. Um, the chorus, he rushes at the doors, they open and reveal a silver... I've never seen cauldron spelled that way. A silver cauldron that holds the body of Agamemnon shrouded in bloody robes. With the body of Cassandra to his left and Clytemnestra standing to his right, sword in hand. And she strides towards the chorus. Words, endless words, I've said to serve the moment. Now it makes me proud to tell the truth. And she owns up to it. Doesn't hide anything. Okay? He had no way to flee or fight his destiny. Our never-ending, all-embracing net. That's our destiny is our net. I cast it wide for the royal hall. I coil him round and round in the wealth, the robes of doom, and then I strike him once, twice, and at each stroke he cries in agony. And at the third last blow to the Zeus who saves the dead beneath the ground, I send that third blow home in homage like a prayer. She revels like the earth when the spring rains come down, the blessed gifts of God and the new green spear. So it stands, elders of Argos, gathered here. Rejoice if you can rejoice. I glory. No. How is the chorus supposed to respond to this? After all, she's been the leader for 10 years. She's just killed the rightful king. What is she expecting from them? Praise? Deference? You appall me. You... Your brazen words exulting over your fallen king. And you, you try me like some desperate woman. In other words, don't think I won't do the same. My heart is steel, well you know. Praise me, blame me, me as you choose. Doesn't matter what you do. Why? She has power. It's all one. Here is Agamemnon. My husband made a corpse by this right hand. A masterpiece of justice, done, is done. And we'll stop there. So, Thursday, uh, yeah, Thursday, um, have the libation bearers ready. And we'll do a quiz at the beginning.